It's a big, big honor for the book fair to have invited Dr. Joy, the young, up and coming, and uh, very uh, famous uh, Indian intellectual novelist uh, to Hong come to Hong Kong. And especially, Dr. Joy has uh, chosen Hong Kong to launch his latest novel, right? yeah. which is going to be uh, on sale in India on the 24th of July. While you're being physically here, all right, shows that uh, what well, just shortens the geographical or even the cultural distance between Hong Kong and India. I mean, we used to share, as Hong Kongers, a very a few chapters in our colonial history. I mean, you ask uh, someone who was born in early 1960s and 70s, uh, we, had, uh, we used to have uh, some Indian neighbors when I was in my kindergarten, there was an Indian a schoolmate who was who happened to be a sick child, sick, sick. Well, I mean, until many years later, after I went to England, uh, I realized that the Sikhs came from the uh, northeastern part of India, Punjab, rather yeah, yeah. than uh, the main uh, continent, or the main uh, isle, uh, peninsula of India, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, we used to live with the Indian people, and we still, some of us enjoy uh, Indian food. There are quite a few good ones uh, on Hollywood Road and uh, uh, near Lan Kwai Fong. Yeah. I've got a couple of very good Indian friends. Yeah. One uh, uh, being named, one the, is uh, Vernon, one is called Vernon, who's in his early 90s, a veteran <laughs> Hong Kong journalist and who's now retired and is now ha living happily on the Lama Island. I mean, we, as a, I could see in Hong Kong, there's a young gen and up and coming generation who get very, a little bit mesmerized by the Indian, uh, uh, modern Indian culture, by films like, uh, um, by films like The Three Idiots, right? And an early one, right? Uh, the Million Dollar, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, directed by the British uh, director Charles Boyle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yet, uh, Hong Kong people seldom go to India because of, you know, many stereotypical perceptions like uh, you could easily catch typhoid and chloria there, and then, you know, have come back uh, with a bad stomach and that sort of things, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that's. <laughs> That, that's a common perception that right. <laughs> you yeah. can get your stomach yeah. in a tizzy. I mean, I had always, I have always, I had always uh, uh, dreamed of going to India, but until I had a car accident in 1940, uh, 1994, I had to cut off uh, two thirds of my spleen, and after which the doctor told me, you know, for the rest of your life, I, I asked him. Now I'm quite happy. I'm quite. I feel quite lucky to be back in one piece. Okay. But uh, you know, will I suffer from any uh, inadequacy after this uh, uh, surgical operation? He said, "You've lost two thirds of your spleen. You are vulnerable to viruses and diseases." My advice to you is that for the rest of your life, you could go to, uh, you know. Uh, Europe and America, Canada and Australia, and even China, even China. But I would avoid, if I were you, going to uh, Africa or India because you could, because your immune system is rather vulnerable. Right? Okay. So, I mean, from then on, I felt a little bit lost. Right? And I, I, I hope one day I could, uh, you know, uh, try this brave adventure. When it gets a little bit older, I go to India and will see that as my potential last trip of my life. But uh, <laughs> anyway. I'm sure it will not be. <laughs> it's good to see a, a, uh, a tiny, cultured, and intellectual, and very uh, wise India coming from, from there to Hong Kong, right? And let's say a few, well, I like to say a few words about Der Joy. I mean, like the author of The Three Idiots, he was educated as an engineering student at the University of Delhi. Yeah. 
And then you went on to do a management course, right? Yes. And then did you become a banker or whatever? Right? Uh, a marketing analyst. Marketing, right. You were doing clearly something extremely different. And how on earth did you turn yourself into the career of writing? Because this would be unimaginable and totally baffling to uh, most Hong Kong parents and students because we have been taught in a very disciplined, if you don't call it rigid, educational system when you uh, uh, go to uh, colleges or universities to train as uh, engineers and then the whole world would assume that you'll come out as an engineer, civil engineer or mechanical or whatever and wouldn't do anything else. Certainly you wouldn't get into this, uh, into the career of writing which would end up uh, with uh, you know, a few disappointed, uh, frustrated writers who would just keep sending his scripts to publishers and uh, get rejected. Right? So what is the magic of uh, the Indian education system that has got this reputation of making uh, its young men so versatile, straddling between two worlds, the world of science and the world of arts? Uh, so, you know, as far as the education system is concerned and engineers turning to writing is concerned, India churns out about, I would say, four to five lakh engineers every year. And a lot of them are uh, pretty incompetent, like me. So, so a few of us aren't that good at what we do. And there's something else that we are better at. So, you know, there's... There, there are always a few black sheep who turn to other professions, and I happen to be one of them. Uh, the other author that you were talking about, he probably, he, he was much more intelligent than I am because he went to the better colleges. <laughs> but, but yes, uh, you know, as far as writing and, and my journey is concerned, I belong to a family that, was, uh, that is based in West Bengal. And West Bengal has this rich tradition of growing up amongst books. So although my family, everybody's an engineer, but everybody has a huge collection of books in their homes. So when I grew up, I was fed on a, on a diet of literary fiction from India, which is, which is respected all around the world. So, uh, so that's, that is how I grew up. So, uh, you know, writing, writing was just an extension of my journey as a reader because you know when you're a reader you're in, in a conversation with an author it's a very personal experience so when I started writing my first book I wanted that conversation to go beyond just reading and maybe start writing so that I have a bigger stake in that conversation and when I started writing my first book I never thought that I'll get published I just did it because it was there it was there to do and even when I got published it wasn't as if it is something that I will do for a living. It was something that I would do because I derive an unhealthy amount of pleasure from it. It is something that I have to do when I go back home, even after work or studying. So this, this is why I started writing because I could not imagine a world without books. And, I could not, and now I could not, cannot imagine a world without me trying to write a book. Your books have very strange and curiously long, but intriguing titles, which uh, you know would uh, just uh, capture the curios curiosity of uh, of your readers. You know, almost at first sight, right, such as uh, "Of course I love you until I meet someone better," and then like this one, "Now that you are rich, let's fall in love." It conceals the kind of sense of. Uh, wit, not just wit, but cynicism, yeah. right? Do these uh, tiny expressions reflect the um, cynical views of uh, most uh, urban Indian young people? Yes, I think I think uh, India, especially in the last four or five years, and even now, there, there's a uh, there's a growing uh, frustration amongst the youth about about everything, about their careers, about education, about how people are. Uh, 
about you know the growing disparity between the poor and the rich or about the have and the have nots so when when i was younger i used the everything used to constantly trouble me so you know although there's there's no there's no common ground where everybody comes up and there's a voice against what you feel is going wrong so when i when i wrote these books i i felt that you know that maybe through the title i can really put out something that i feel strongly about uh and i used to be a cocky young guy i i did not you know uh, mind putting out stuff that people would be sort of uncomfortable about so but over the years i have sort of realized that maybe i should sort of mellow down a little so <laughs> my latest books do not have cocky titles like the first few ones cocky means arrogant arrogant and you know uh, so you never have problem with the dating girls is the other way around you have pretty girls <laughs> flocking towards you although I mean, which is not uh, surprising because you are quite good looking mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, i i would not call myself arrogant mm -hmm. as such or that i was arrogant i was just angry mm -hmm. so the, the angry yeah so I... the, and and it's a, it's a it's a very it's a very common feeling amongst the indian youth everybody has the simmering rage inside him or her which he or she cannot channel into something better because there's a lack of opportunity there's a lack of opportunities that that are out there so so yeah the, the it's it's very common amongst the indian youth it's it's getting better but it'll still take time well in some of your novels right um there's uh, a, a, a reflection of uh, the social reality in india yeah. right the uh, gap between the rich and the poor you know urban lives and that sort of things you know as a young man you get stuck in this a very complex uh, economic and social fabrics of india today right it shows a certain kind of well cynicism uh in in the romance right So is it hard? Well, you do you consider yourself from coming from a middle class background? Yes. yes. So uh even I am from a middle class background. So uh, when it when it comes to why engineering and why writing. So you know the the only way you can sort of break the web of being somebody who belongs to a middle class family or a lower middle class family and go to the upper rungs of the society is to choose a career which will guarantee you success. so if you ask me why engineering it was my way out of the web so that i can be in the top top like top percentage of people who are economically and socially you know they have everything so you know that's the that's the only thing that will help you break those barriers and now when i've shifted into writing i could only do that because i know that you know writing will sustain me as an individual a lot of people cannot or even i could not have taken the risk at the outset that i'll just go out there and start writing because i have to secure a future first and it's 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 not that it's not in the other parts of the world as well but in india if you if you do not have a successful career you are absolutely nowhere yeah well this pragmatism is found uh everywhere in the far east right malaysia Malaysian Chinese or Taiwanese or Chinese mainland Chinese and Hong Kong people because uh, we over here do not believe what well, our parents and teachers don't have a strong belief in uh, having uh, in encouraging students and children to do uh, uh, to do humanities subjects like fine art philosophy and history i mean these disciplines are always sidelined or a little bit Well, marginalized in uh, colleges and universities so i mean taking myself an example i had developed a strong aspiration or love for uh, literature and arts but in my secondary school years you know my hobbies and my uh, inclinations were very much frowned upon by my parents and many relatives so I mean is that a similar case for you had you been given a choice free choice or would you have done something like uh, literature or latin uh, at oxford or cambridge 
No, I don't think I would have done that because because you know I was conditioned in a way that you were buried uh, in books and Yeah, but I was conditioned mm. see books was a big part of my life but I was conditioned that you know you have to do engineering and it's not and I was good at the sciences it mm. wasn't that I was really bad because I I did manage to crack a few competitive exams and I was good at it I did not really uh think that you know studying about physics or chemistry was something that that really bothers me I used to enjoy doing that uh but it's it it's also that you know I I don't know whether it's in the same in the whole eastern region but uh in India you are supposed to finish your education as as soon as possible so when you're 17 you're you are given the responsibility to choose what you are going to do for the rest of your life so at 17 it's very hard for a 17 year old to say that okay i am going to be a writer or i am going to be a doctor or i am going to be an engineer uh, i think after school or after college there should be a gap of two or three years where people you know go out and see see what the different career options are and then decide okay this is what i'm going to major in had i uh, had those two or three years I would have probably figured out that you know I want to get into writing, not not necessarily a writer writer, but maybe even journalism. But since at seventeen you have this responsibility of choosing your career path, you know engineering sort of made sense. You sort out your bread and butter first, right? Yeah. Before going on to some luxury of free thinking, creativity, and uh, and uh, imagination. So were you already good in maths and physics as a yes, I, yeah, in your I, I, teenage? Yes, I was. I, I was pretty good at it. Uh, if, once I found myself in an engineering college where everybody was as good as me or better than me, that's when I thought maybe I'm not the best person to do this. But in school, I used to be pretty good. So, you know, I used to finish in the top five every time. But, you know, when you get so many people who are good, who are in their top five in a premier engineering college, the ones who are not as good, they th they start to think, okay, this is this is not something that I'm supposed to do. In that case, how could you manage uh, being a young scientist and uh, a, a a young avid writer at the same time? So it's, it's because it's divided between your yeah. left brain and right brain, according to some uh, you know posh and fashionable scientific. Uh, Theories and one cannot possibly, or is very unlikely, to have both brains, both hemispheres, uh, powerful and strong. You are either good in left, in the left, or the right. Okay. Uh, I think I think that's that's where you make your priorities. That you know, I that's that's where you go from studying because you like studying because you want to be proficient at the subject to changing that to you want to do well in your exams. So my concentration was not to know, say, automation to the best of one's ability. My, my concentration was to do well in my exams. So when you, when, you, when you try to do that, you obviously free up a lot of your time. And the time I freed up was spent reading books or writing. So my concentration had shifted within the first one year of my engineering to scoring well in my exams. That is all I care about. How has your childhood or life experience in metropolitan cities like Delhi uh, influenced you in the career of writing? I think, I think uh, in, a, in a city like Delhi, especially in India, even if you're living in a metropolitan city, it's, it's the experiences that you go through are, are very varied because uh, the disparity between the rich and the poor, it's very apparent, right? That the people who come out of luxury homes sit in their, you know, seven series and they'll go on the streets and you'll find a cow. You go to the next signal and you'll find someone begging. So, you know, the and, and the interesting part is that on the face of it, you'll think that, okay, this guy is begging. But if you go to the backstory, maybe a beggar earns more than a plumber. So, so there are interesting stories scattered all around a city like Delhi, which which has so many people coming from so many different states of India, which which bring together the, their cultures from their own states, and it's it's a it's a melting pot of a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds who have who each of them have their different stories. 
So it it sort of preps you for for life and for experiences. So I met uh, Louis de Bernier yesterday, the famous English writer who uh, told his Hong Kong readers how traveling extensively to countries ranging from Colombia to Turkey and Cyprus uh, has benefited in his uh, uh, literary imagination. So have you traveled extensively in India? Because you, know, you, had, uh, you have a very good and long uh, literary tradition dated back to Tagore, right? Yeah. And then uh, what you had the famous Nobel uh, winner, you know, Na Napul, right? Yeah. Who has written on uh, on the topic of uh, decolonization? Yeah. Right? And uh, India is certainly a very uh, Im important integral part of the global village. It belongs to the third world. And it's got the 6,000 years of civilization. And fortunately, it has never undergone something like the Cultural Revolution. So the good values you know, are, very, are still very re preserved and retained. Good ancient architectures and temples, even Victorian style, of, uh, even uh, what the train station of Victorian styles are very much uh, preserved and retained yeah. in major cities. You come from a very rich uh, background, right? Yeah. So do you consider yourself you know, a, a, a modern young Indian writer with uh, some global Im interests? Yeah, so uh, you know, when, you, when you come from a place like India, which is, which is so vast, and you know, where the dialect, the how, how people behave, how people live, and what people eat changes like every 300, 400 kilometers. It obviously, it first overwhelms you. And then we, as and when you go deeper into it, there are many stories behind it. So even, even if I belong to a state uh, which is in the eastern part of India, which is West Bengal, I have relatives scattered all over India. And what, what it does is that everybody starts imbibing some or the other characteristics of other culture in their own culture. So at the end of the day, what happens is that you, you get to live a lot more many lives than, than just one. So, you, you know, and, and coming, coming from a place like Delhi where, where everyone from every state comes and lives in, it gives you a sort of a feel what every state is like. So, yeah, so uh, you know, it 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 is a good experience, you know, coming from a country like India, which 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 where every region has a rich history. I mean, if you if you from the north, where where every where every king and every kingdom used to be very aggressive, you go to south, where everybody everybody has been always kind of more peaceful. So yes, the tradition part really helps. So, I mean, in Hong Kong, right? Well, Indian, India gained its independence as early as 1948. Uh, the and your writers or the young, even the young generation have uh, contributed so much to the English writing world. Whereas in Hong Kong, you know, we, had, uh, we are now so-called uh, enjoying the one country, two systems, high degree of autonomy. So many people complain about the decline of uh, the English language. So how, what is the magic about uh, Indian education system, which after more than 60 years of independence still generate uh, brilliant uh, English writers who are not only good at writing memos and uh, writing some kind of uh, what uh, policy policy speeches, as uh, shown by our chief executive, you know, boring, humdrum, and the lackluster English style. I mean, what, what what happened to the English teaching, English language education system? Were you encouraged to work, to read a lot of books, and is grammar being taught in a rigid way? since primary school. This is what we do here in Hong Kong. 
five-year-old kids were taught how to, to remember, you know, vague terms which don't make sense, like uh, past participle, like uh, subjunctive and preposition and conjunction or whatever. And then as you go through your English tests, you are given, you know, gaps to fill where to tell whether this is a conjunction or a preposition. And this is the sort of things that put off a lot of our Chinese kids in Hong Kong because uh, it's, uh, it's like uh, studying math or chemistry, um, trying to remember terms like subjunctive and past participles. It's like uh, trying to remember names of rare metals yeah. and chemicals and things like that. And that put off a lot of people. You know? it's, uh, how did you learn language from your primary school years? Um. First of all, I do not know what a conjunction is, but <laughs> but you know, uh, as you, as you mentioned, a five-year-old, a five-year-old, you, no matter what you try to teach him, it'll be it'll be tough for him to get it. Uh, but even in I, I I don't know, but uh, if I got a conjunction wrong when I was five, I I'm pretty sure I would have been caned. So it's that it's that strict in India. But you have to get your rules right so that you can you know grow up and you can master the language uh, the, it's it's i think the indian education system why english is that important is because india is trying to uh, make its place in the global uh, global scenario so english is one language that will break a lot of barriers so english is a very important language for people to learn and you know uh, it is important to get your rules right when you're young so that you can go go ahead when you're an adult and play around with it so uh, it is important, and, and plus in India, at least in my school, there used to be periods that were strictly dedicated to reading. There are extra marks if you read extra books, there are extra marks if you read newspapers, and there, there are examinations that test you on that. So that is, that, is, that is how they start to sort of inculcate the habit of reading, and India reads in a lot of different languages. Even though English is not India's native language, still I think it's the second largest market for English books. So the the habit of reading is pretty much there, and India, you know, one of I don't think it's a reason, but uh, internet and Facebook and Twitter, it's not as prevalent in India. You know, the internet connections are still slow, so there there are lesser things to distract people. So yeah, I think I think all of this helps. Uh, you know, not not getting distracted. Uh, spending your time with books is still very much a part of Indian culture and you'll find a lot of people reading books in India. I mean it's 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 also very you know as young people it's also what's what's a cool thing to do reading books is a very cool thing to do in India when you're when you're well read you're respected if you're not well read you're, you're just like anybody else. Well you deal with romance yeah. right, of the contemporary Indian uh, cities and societies and uh, India has got a very strong religious cultural background. And Indian women's role right, over there is sometimes uh, raises concern by the world. You know? And uh, young girls still, when they get married, right, they pay a uh, handsome dowry right, to the husband's, or the, uh, to the husband's uh, yeah. family. Right? Yeah. So, but but in the rest of the world, feminism has been rising, right? So how do you see uh, this, uh, t these discrepancies, you know, as far as the role of female is concerned, while treating your women's characters in your novels? Okay. So as you said, the tradition is not always a good thing. So, uh, yeah, all these things, but the, uh, uh, you talked about dowry, right? When, when the girl family has to pay the boy's family a certain amount, it's, it's illegal. So, illegal. yeah, it's, there are laws against that. So you can't do that anymore. So there's rising awareness about that. Everybody knows that, you know, this is not the right thing to do. But, but there are some things that are hard to shake off, and it will eventually go. And, and, you know, as you as you move from the rural parts of India to the urban centers of India, a lot of awareness is there, and a lot of a lot of you know it. Everything has to do with education. The more people get educated, the more people get aware 
of where where the position of women are in the society is in the society it will get better so it's it's not that india as a country does not recognize where women should stand or what's what's her position is in the society it's just that it'll take some time for for uh, you know women to be up there with the men and it's happening so the discrepancy is just because india is starting late it is it is in in the next 10 years 20 years it will be there or maybe even ahead so it it just takes a few examples to you know to set the tone that okay women can do whatever they want to in india as well it's just that so uh, so when when it comes to my books every every girl in my book is probably working somewhere every woman is very health strong every woman is very ambitious every woman is career oriented so i do not want to even through my books i do not want to give a false impression that you know women are second to men if anything the men are uh, less independent they are they are they not as strong as the women because they think that you know it i mean any society can only progress if the women in the society are strong so 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 your works right no wonder are very much welcomed by female readers in india right Yes, I think so. <laughs> I would like to think so. All right. <laughs> so, um, uh, what did you sometimes, you know, encounter any writer's block? I mean, this is uh, a very, uh, you know, prolific uh, 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 volume of writings. You, you've, you're still very young. You've published what? Eight books already? Yeah, this is my ninth. The ninth one yeah. to be launched in Hong Kong. Yeah. I mean, this is incredible volume of work, right? Nine or eight books, and you are you are not yet uh, what? How old are you? Not yet thirty. I'm twenty-six. Yeah. yeah. I'm twenty-six. Yeah, twenty-six, and one can hardly imagine the coming thirty years how many more books you would produce, right? Shakespeare only wrote thirty-seven uh, plays altogether. But he died in uh, 52, you know? and now you are approaching about uh, uh, what a quarter of his uh, capacity, as far as uh, number is concerned. Right? How come you wrote, you've been writing so efficiently and smoothly? I think I think it 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 has to do with uh, with the kind of background I have. You know, uh, when you come from a science kind of a background you a lot asked to what you do so no matter what i write i make sure that i sit down every day in front of a computer and stare at it, stare at it for 3 hours at an end even if i do not produce anything so i think that keeps me away from you know finding problems writing so uh you know when you when you are striving that hard to put something down on paper you eventually do because you have every reason not to write you just have to sit down and try to write mm. so if if so even if there goes a day that i do not sit down in front of a computer that day will translate into seven more days so i just make sure that i sit and try to write mm. so it's not that i do not go through writers blocks but my writer blocks are more like i'm writing bad stuff but that's still okay because you're still writing and there will be a chance that you'll come back to it and rewrite it but if you stop writing you know that, that that's when you stop thinking so i have to write because i have to keep thinking about what i'm writing do you discipline yourself right yes. restricting I, how many words you have to produce every week no yeah. i i don't i don't, i don't put limits i i put limits in terms of time as in a minimum limit that okay i have to sit down for at least 2 hours a day not less than that mm. but other than that if i feel like writing i've written 10000 words a day out of them i might have deleted like 9000 the very next day but you know if i feel like writing i do not stop myself wow this is still amazing right <laughs> so um your latest book right is curiously uh to the great cities of delhi in hong kong now you have ne- never lived in hong kong before no. right So how come Hong Kong uh, has come into your dream you know, or uh, or has been uh, has been mobilized by your muse you know and introduced to you <laughs> yeah. So uh, when I started writing this book I had this idea that uh, about the main characters of the book uh, but 
I had written I had written a good ten twelve thousand words for it, but it wasn't going anywhere. And then I received uh, this proposal from Hong Kong Tourism Board that you know why don't you come to Hong Kong and see if you can set a story here. And uh, so I came here, and the and the and the talks are in very preliminary stages that whether it will happen or not. So I came here on my own. That you know, let me see whether I can set the story here. I came here. I stayed for stayed here for eight days, and uh, after that, I called them up and I told them that you know, I think I can do this. Mm -hmm. I think I I feel that Hong Kong is a place that my characters need to go to to explore to you know f find a culmination for their story. And that's how I thought that you know Hong Kong plays an important role in the story, mm. because the only reason the story wasn't going forward is because I did not know where to place it, mm. because all my books have have uh, are set in New Delhi, so I wanted a different setting, but it wasn't going anywhere. So Hong Kong gave me that opportunity to, you know, get the story out there. So you've never been to Hong Kong, have you? Or f f before, before. before. Yeah, so this yes. is my second time. Your second time, only. Yeah. So when was it your your first time? My first time was in early March. What? When? When? Oh, uh, this year. Oh, this year. Yeah. So before, even before, what? After you wrote the book, after you finished the novel. No, no, no. So I I wrote like thirty, forty percent of the book. Then I came to Hong Kong, and then I finished the book. All right. So in the middle of your writing, you came yeah, to yeah. Hong Kong. Yeah, yeah. And then you finished your book. That means you started off writing this novel. Uh, out of uh, no knowledge of Hong Kong whatsoever, no. except your imagined, imaginative one. Yeah. So, so when I write, I just, I, I just start developing the characters, and the main message. Mm. It's only after that that you know I put in other elements. So yeah. Mm. Well, you know, I have the what. Uh, I admit that you know I haven't read this book. You know, I've, if someone has just given it to me, but uh, flipping it through, you know, uh, is was well, some of the uh, uh, paragraphs are really amazing. You know, if I could read uh, one, as he entered the hotel, luxurious and opulent beyond his saniest dreams, he felt privileged, spoiled, and even lucky. More so when he found himself next to a girl who was beautiful, fair, and proportionate like a goddess and the figures in Da Vinci's sketches. He wanted to make sure it wasn't one of his open-eyed dreams. They were on the elevator to the top of the hotel, and he could see them, the girl and him, riding together into the sun like the elevator of the chocolate factory that broke right through the building and floated into the yellowness, the yellowness of the sun, the yellowness of Hong Kong. Aha, Hong Kong, right? I mean, this is really, you know, the most romanticized version of the city I've ever seen. You know, having lived after having lived here for so many years, you know, I could never, you know, imagine Hong Kong could be that visually, you know, exuberant and uh, mesmerizing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. But it's it's also it's also when you when you come to a city for the first time, you see the city in a different light. When you're sitting. When you're living in the city for a really, really long time, you take to you tend to take things for granted, and then you do not you you miss out on a lot of things. It's it's only from a traveler's eyes that you can see how beautiful your city is. So I hope, well, hotels in Hong Kong, you know, on your trip here, don't wouldn't give you, uh, you know, some otherwise perception because. Uh, as Hong Kong people, we are horrified by the buzzing, noisy Chinese tourists, you know, squeezed in the same <laughs> elevator who talk very, very loud, and some of them smoke, right? So, I mean, I, I, would, I would say you've come to Hong Kong not at a very good timing. Had you been born, had you bo been born a few decades earlier, come to Hong Kong and visited the uh, the Mandarin or Peninsula in the year of 1983, yes, I would say this could be a, uh, 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 the, 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 the image or perception of Hong Kong then, right? But now, oh my goodness, I hope, right? Uh, we as Hong Kong readers, after having gone, after going through the journey together uh, with an Indian writer here, would have some you know, sentimental or nostalgic reflections on this city 
in which we were born and brought up. And then, you know, sometimes we rely on foreign writers to help us to re-recognize the city we live in. For example, Love is a Many Splendid Thing, you know, a novel written many decades ago by, uh, by Han Xu Ying, you know, uh, when the city of Hong Kong, the background was set in early 1950s, soon after the Korean War, and that was, uh, that was turned into a romantic Hollywood film. And uh, some of the film clips can be seen on the YouTube. It's six minutes long, the fishing village in Abadin, and then the my meandering roads, you know, leading from the city of Wen Chai to uh, to the peak and that sort of things. Right? Okay. <laughs> so, thank you very much for, you know, linking, giving us, presenting this uh, beautiful link between the city of New Delhi and Hong Kong. And I hope one day, you know, some of the tourist groups, you know, tourist agencies in Hong Kong would organize trips to New Delhi and even go as uh, beautifully as uh, what mentioned in your book. Have you been there, to another Portuguese enclave, Go in India? Uh, where? Port that uh, Portuguese enclave on the eastern coast of India. Uh, I don't think Goa. So. Goa. Yeah, yeah. Right. I've yes. been to Goa. <laughs> Yeah, when you put it like that, yes. <laughs> yeah. Have you been there? Yeah. Yes. Many times. Is that is it very different from other cities of India? Um, it it is it is like the premier destination where people mm. go when they want to have a good time. Mm. So uh, and the city is very relaxed. So it's it's predominantly that. Uh, it's it's very beautiful to look at. It's very calming. It's very peaceful. Uh, and you know, it looks like nobody works here. So yeah, it's it's a different experience. Then you must take a side trip to Macau from Hong Kong while you are here and ask your host, the TDC, to pay you for another <laughs> a nice in the luxury hotel there. Or do well, it's a Portuguese enclave, but now it's been turned into a replica of Las Vegas, you know, in the Far East. Whether it's a good thing or not, it uh, depends on uh, opinions. <laughs> so. How have uh, have you been inspired by any great Indian English writers or native writers? Yeah, I think I think I uh, grew up reading Tagore. Tagore, right? yeah. So uh, he yeah. writes in a dialect, in a very rare dialect, rather than Hindi. Is that true? He writes in Bengali. He, he Bengali, I mean, yes, yeah, this yeah, one, yes. Yeah, he writes in Bengali, and he also writes. Uh, he, I mean, he's not. He's not restrictive in what he writes. So he writes full novels, he writes poetry, uh, he writes short stories. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every Bengali kid grows up reading him. So, you know, I, I would not say I'm directly inspired by him, but it's, it's, something, that, uh, it's something that I grew up reading. It's something uh, that I remember reading from my childhood. And apart from that, you know, uh, when you're a kid in India, you read a lot of uh, foreign authors. Mm. But do you do you speak or read uh, Bengali? I can talk in Bengali. I cannot read it. All right. So yeah. when you read Tagore, it's in English. It, yeah, we read it in All English. Right. So yeah. you're reading the same stuff as uh, I have, because yeah. I found Tagore's poetry so so touching. You know, he uh, he uh, builds up the kind of inner emotional sentimental link with nature, which goes all the way into the very depth of the universe that would uh, lead you into profound ref reflection upon the meaning of life. You know? I mean, it's, it's amazing stuff. That, that's, that's why he, his work has endured over so many years. I think the, the only, uh, I mean, a lot of people get into this conversation that was, what is literary fiction and what is commercial fiction. And uh, I think the, the only definition that I do believe that what literary fiction is, is something that, that endures over a really long period of time. So, if somebody asks me that, you know, whether this book is literary fiction, I said, if people is, are still reading it after 50 years, it is literary fiction. Mm, yes. And um, how is literature taught in India's secondary uh, school? So, in school, it's not, it's not taught at all. Mm. I mean, we, we do have, uh, so in India, it's, 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 we generally concentrate on language and not on, like, specific 
great Indian novels or great no. novels. Uh, yeah. Mm. So it's it's we are just concentrate. We are just concentrating on the language. Mm. It's only once you get in college, you you start to concentrate on you know different novels and different different mm. styles of writing. So up till up till school, it's just language. What about Indian mythology? I mean, we in Hong Kong. Uh, our knowledge about India is the shared um, mythological image of the monkey king, which is called uh, Hanuman yeah. in Hinduism, who held the king right to uh, dispel uh, troops of invaders. Okay. And his heroism was very much recorded in a very long epic. right? Yeah. And uh, Hanuman was imported into China in... Uh, I think um, 16th century, and that was turned into a classical novel. Uh, the Monkey King uh, also served as a as a warrior to protect a monk uh, sent from Chang'an, the capital of the Tang Dynasty, who set on a long journey to go to India to collect the Buddhist scripts. Right. So I mean, since childhood, a few kids of uh, Hong Kong or in China have been obsessed with the uh, king, monkey king Hanuman. Right? Okay. Uh, but uh, mythology in India is it's still, it's, I mean, how I know my mythology and how uh, other people around me know, know their mythology is, is still through a lot of storytelling, oral storytelling. So whatever my mom told me or whatever people around me or my grandmother would tell me, that's what I know about mythology. It's not still a lot of reading that people do to know what, you know, about Hanuman or about Ram or about Ramayana. So it's not, it does not come from reading. It comes from, you know, what is told by your parents or what is told by your grandmother. So it's a lot of that, you know, it, it, because I think it started like that, you know, as oral storytelling, it was, it was just that somewhere down the line, somebody thought that it, we would put this in writing, but the tradition still continues. So it'll be long drawn stories about Hanuman, about Ram, about Sita, about Ravan that still go on. But obviously that tradition has to stop somewhere because I do not know as much about Ramayana as probably my grandmother knows. So probably my the coming generation would, would have to read a book about it. So, yeah. so do you like the film uh, Pi, right? I do. I mean, it's visually it's very. A, it's appealing. a novel written by yeah, a Canadian, yeah. not an Indian writer. Yeah. Do you think that reflects uh, faithfully what happens in India and its cultural origins or background or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, you know, whenever whenever there are movies that are made on India, uh, you obviously have a more critical uh, appraisal of that, mm. and then you're like, maybe it's not that uh, true a representation. But, but certainly, then, the yeah. dancing in candlelight. And in very colorful rooms, you know, are visually very striking. Yeah, visually the, the movie was, the visually the movie was absolutely overwhelming. Mm. It was brilliantly made. Mm. So, I mean, since the majority of the audience here in this auditorium is, uh, what, local Hong Kong Chinese, so may I just summarize what, uh, what the young talent has just said in, in a few Kennedy's lines before I invite questions from you. 这位是张卓,他是印度的 Sayoko,three-eaters, 他在這些很多講的印度大城市
啊，佢又係一位而家非常之成功嘅小説家，而且最重要係點解咧喺印度獨立咗六十年之後，仲啲英文仲係咁好啊？普遍喎、哦，唔止係佢一個。咁啊，英文好咧，係令到印度咧係成為不但係今日英聯邦嘅會員國啦，而且係佢係一個民主國家。當然佢有好多種種嘅問題啦，係嘛啊？但係咧，佢係一個即係而家嘅新興嘅嗰個。啊，誒、嗯、一個發展中嘅國家，係嘛？咁呢樣嘢咧，我真係好希望香港有啲家長同埋教育局嘅官員咧，都會喺呢個座談會度咧聽到佢啲問一啲問題。因為我自己覺得十六年以來，香港係忽略咗由印度嗰度學下，點解人哋印度一樣係脱離英國殖民管治，但係到今日咧啲英文都咁好，個語文教育到底係點，係嘛？咁所以咧。而家俾翻各位咧，有啲咩問題，儘量咧係用翻英文咧去舉手啦，問下佢啊。So question time, right? Ah,、uh, I'm sorry. I just want to uh, uh, just uh, read, read your book. Ah,、uh, I don't know what I. Pulang your surname is correct or not, Mister Tata? Yeah, it's correct. Tata. Yeah. Okay.、Uh, according to your book,、uh, I don't know whether this is a true story,、uh, but I don't think that is a true story, uh, no, no, as you、no. mentioned.、Uh, this is、uh, about a bright girl, and、uh, you, they are, you know,、uh, leading, but in. In this、uh, forum title is reading amongst young people.、Uh, why your page forty、uh, six? There for one word. Damn it! <laughs> I did not get you. <laughs> you read your page forty six. There's just a water been believe us. Damn it! If this is a right English word in this、uh, sentence, your expression for this is、uh, whether, one question. Whether whether the expression is right? Yeah. Why? Why? Because this is the reading amongst young people, correct? Yeah. And young people need to learn. Damn it. <laughs> oh, okay. Whether whether okay. <laughs> um. So this is this is this is this is also how people talk, right? This is this is not a, a a guide to how people should talk or about grammar. So you know this is how people talk, and and a book has to be a true representation of how people behave or how the society is. So you can't really cut corners. So if somebody says "damn it," you have to write "damn it." Okay. Yeah. Okay.、Uh, another another question is、uh, regarding your page one hundred sixty four. You read one sixty-four pages. <laughs> If I, I read it and I mentioned about you mentioned, Jim Sa Choi smell nice a street in South Delhi. How do you smell Jim Sa Choi? <laughs> you can't smell it. You can smell India in it. Yeah. I mean, it's it's pre dom. I mean,、no. if it's. How do you feel about? No, no. How you smell Jim Sajoy? <laughs> I think I think you have to close your eyes and just <laughs> and just stand at a place yeah. and smell what, what, it. What's this? What's you, 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 your fear、uh, about Jim Sajoy? How、yeah. can you describe you, any smell?、Uh, how you smell it? What is that?、Uh, you 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 feel it's uh you know uh you know uh a good smell or or、uh, something special smell? <laughs> Well, I don't. I, I don't care about your writing in this book.、Uh, Aman, I just、uh, very briefly, and I know not much uh, uh, vocabulary. Uh, you can understand, and this is quite good、uh, for young people. But uh, but、um, uh, the title is reading amongst young people. How you want to leading us? On this, as in how 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 you leading the reading, 
How do I want to get How, that message across? Yes, yeah, because your that's the title. We think amongst young people. You want you want me to explain that? Or yes, yes, yes. I want. That can can you explain it? As in, how do I want to promote that? I I did, I'm not getting your question at all. Yeah. Okay. 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 I I I do get an idea. Uh, see, the thing is that uh, one of one of the main themes of the book is is how imp how important is reading to us and why people should read. So the main character. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in parts. Yeah. I don't know what is. I, I haven't finished the, the ending. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so when you read the book, you you'll find that there uh, there there are a lot of uh, subtext to the whole book, and falling in love is is not the only thing that happens in the book. I actually have two questions for you. Um, the first one is, um, in a society, or at least when, in a world where we have so many Indian writers, um, especially some of the prevalent ones like Arunthati Roy, Chumpaleri, or even Chetan Pagat, how do you see yourself standing out amongst a crowd with such, um, with, with writers who have made a really big name for themselves? I think I think they have decades of experience more than me, so I have a lot of time. And secondly, I do not do not want to stand out amongst them. I want to make a place for myself. So it does not. I'm not trying to ape anybody in terms of what they have done. So I want to do the same. And you know, every every writer has this own uh, own niche. So what say a Chetan Bhagat writes is very different from what Arundhati Rai writes or what Salman Rushdie writes. So every every writer. You know, writing is a profession where you do not directly compete with another writer. You're, you're the only person you're competing with or the only thing you're competing with is your old book. So you want to do better than what you did last time. Okay. Um, my second question is, you earlier mentioned how the Indian youth um, has a lot of frustrations when it comes to the Indian society. Um, your books, however, um, they're more along the lines of uh, romantic fiction. Do you think that something like maybe politics or social issues would be something that you would tackle in your future books? Uh, yes. Uh, see, there, there are two parts to it. Um, a, yes, I would when I have a better understanding of it. And B, I'm not saying that that too won't be a book which is on romance. Because, you know, a, a very famous journalist, Manu Joseph, just said that, you know, when... S I think Amartya Sen said that Indian media is very frivolous when they show news about gossip. But Manu Jose replied that you know you have to package everything in a way that you lure your reader or your viewer inside the entertainment box, and then you give him meaningful messages. So you know a romance book can have subtexts that are much more important, you know, than the romance. Would you end up romanticizing or placing an entertainment value to, yes, say, I mean, for example? I mean, yeah, that, that, that is something that you have to do because, you know, uh, say, say a 21-year-old, uh, he has the option of going out to the movies or he has the option to be on Facebook and waste his time or on, be on Twitter. And you have this book, which is predominantly something that will, that will take three, four hours of locking yourself in a room. So you have to sort of get him to sit in this in that room, read the book, feel good about himself, and then deliver the message. So you have to take care of that that thing. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. That gentleman first. 
Uh, Mr. Data, as you may know, uh, here in Hong Kong, like uh, a lot of uh, Chinese parents like to speak English to their children, even though their English is not is really not that well. And so my question is that: um, Do do Indian families would pro uh, would greatly promote using English in their own family? Communications, or and whether do you think that um, that contributes to the high level of English proficiency in India? Uh, for the first part, yes. You know, a lot of a lot of five, six year old kids be speak better fluent English than me. But the second part is that you know you should not ignore your native language because although I may not be as fluent as the twelve year olds in India who have been brought up on a steady diet of communicative english but i'm not sure whether they can write good english which is which is which is a, which is more important than speaking good english right so uh, what what it does is that you know a lot of a lot of youngsters in india they cannot speak hindi as well as they should i mean how i was brought up was both both these languages were given equal footage i used to read and talk in english in school but when i was at home i used to speak in bengali and in hindi you know, you have to have uh, the background of at least two or three languages because, you know, it it makes you a, a better person because you can read so much stuff. I can read in Hindi, I can read in English and not all works in Hindi or in Bengali are translated into English. So I, I don't think it's a very healthy trend that, you know, as kids uh, uh, from Chinese parents or from Indian parents, you should be like communicating in just English. Do you think that it is hard to strike a balance between uh, learning your native language and le and learning English? No, I think I think I think uh, as far as native language is concerned, it should be up to the parents. And as far as learning English or other language is concerned, you should concentrate on learning it at school. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm, I was very wondering, do you think that uh, writing in English is, uh, is a kind of uh, experiment uh, or something like, uh, or, or you just think in uh, Eng uh, English style? Um, I, I think it's very interesting that a few Chinese writers would tend to use English to write books. So is it, is it very common in, in your country that uh, uh, to uh, write book in English? And why do why don't you write in India? Thank you. No, uh, yeah. So the thing is that you know uh, the language that you think you're good at uh, when you're writing is the language that you end up writing in. So while I will be more fluent in Hindi while I'm talking, I am better at expressing emotions uh, when I'm writing in English. So so if if I'm talking to a person in India, normally I would talk in Hindi. But if I were in a fight with that person, I would switch to English. <laughs> so that, that is how it works. Yeah. So do, you, do you think you live in an English style way? Sometimes you live in an English style or write in English style? Not really. I, 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 I mean, uh, in, fact, in fact, when uh, back in Delhi, when you know, when I'm writing in English all day and when I'm reading in English all day, I do not like to talk in English with my with my peers. So because I'm like, I've had enough of English in a day. <laughs> now I want the other language to kick in. Hi. Um, you're an engineering student, so I just wanted to know how is it, like without any qualifications or training, to gather the confidence, like to write for yourself or even approach publishers, like without much, you know, found grounding, so to say, in uh, writing. I, I had the experience of reading about a thousand books, so so I had that background. Okay. So and and as far as the confidence is concerned, I wasn't confident at all. I did not think that I'd get published. So I just wrote it and I went ahead and submitted it. It was just a lucky break that they decided to publish it. And uh, I, I really thought it would go out of print, but it did not, and it worked out well for me. Uh, 
Um, I was interested to hear that you were invited to Hong Kong by the Hong Kong Tourism Board. Um, did you ask them why they had invited you? <laughs> The reason why I asked is I was wondering whether they wanted to promote Hong Kong in a romantic style amongst young Indian readers. I, I'm sure they did, but I, I, I'm not sure I'm the right person to ask this question, that why me? Uh, but did you not ask yourself why me? I do not ask questions when I'm, I'm given opportunities. I just accept it and not... <laughs> So yes, but but I'm lucky that they called me here because because you know I I I when they when they approached me I was like you know I'm not promising you anything. Let me see how your city is and then I'll you know tell you that whether I can do it. So that's the only question that I asked. No, not from them. That why me? So they they just wanted you to promote Hong Kong. They they wanted to see whether I could do it. It was they threw it in the air, air and I got it. And okay. It Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, firstly. Thank you. Um, I just had a quick question. Uh, could you tell me some of your favorite, uh, you know, Indian authors who write in English and uh, non-Indian authors who write in English as well, who have inspired you over the years, you know, as well? Okay, so... Uh my current favorites in Indian authors, they are Manu Joseph and uh, and, uh, and for people who are not from India, my current favorite is John Green. He, I, he writes for young adults. So, you know, my favorite authors keep on changing as far as, uh, you know, as and when I read their books. So, uh, and I grew up reading a lot of Roald Dahl when I was, when I was a kid. That he was like my initi initiation into reading books. And uh, then when I, when, I, when I got into literary reading, it obviously started with Tagore. And then it went on to the works of Arundhati Roy and Salman Rushdie, although I'm not a big fan of Salman Rushdie. Uh, but, <laughs> but yeah, so uh, you know, I, I, since I do not have a structured approach to reading, I pick out an author, I read a book, then I forget about the author, then maybe come back to that and read another book of his. That is how I approach my reading. Um, I would like to ask um, this question. Did you experience any cultural shock when you arrived in Hong Kong? Um, the reason for my asking this question is how um, how I found Hong Kong often romanticized in some other ways, in, in movies, especially Hollywood movies. Um, because yeah, uh, last week I watched um, Pacific Rim. I wonder if everybody has, has watched that. And uh, the film actually depicted Hong Kong in the way that it was still in the 60s or, or 70s, the way how um, maybe Wong Kar Wai um, um, shaped Hong Kong in, in his movie. So, I wonder if you found Hong Kong a lot different from, from your expectation. Thank you. Uh, uh, the thing is that everything happened so quickly that I did not have a uh, chance to mold my opinion about Hong Kong before I came here. But I did, I did think of it as a very metropolitan city, maybe a few steps ahead of Delhi. That, that's what I uh, came in mind with when I came to Hong Kong, that this will be what Hong Kong is. But what I, when I came here, I also realized that um, and Hong Kong is also very warm. And, you know, metropolitans like Hong Kong, uh, which look like Hong Kong, aren't that warm. You know, because I realized that, you know, the bigger city you go to in Delhi, the more disconnected people are. And I was just talking to somebody uh, this morning about Hong Kong. I was, I, was, I was actually shocked that, you know, how concerned people are. I don't know whether it happens in city, but, I mean between the people of Hong Kong, but it certainly happened with me, that everybody is trying to assure that, you know, you're, you're comfortable and that, that, you know, you're getting all the help that you need. Because I remember the last time I came to Hong Kong, there's this huge metro station, I think it's central or some, some place. So I wanted to know where the exit is. And I was still in the, in the MTR. So there was a person who got down from the metro and he escorted me to the exit. I thought he'll, he'll probably get down at that exit. 
but when i got out he got back and he boarded the metro again so i was i was that would never happen i mean i i have never had that you know happen to me so i thought they have and there there's this paragraph in this book that when the guy lands in hong kong and he gets into a taxi the taxi driver says the word okay about 15 times just to make sure that there there's an understanding between the main character and and the cab driver and it actually happened with me you know he asked me that are you sure you want to get get here are you sure do you do you have the address can you show me the address so it w- the, the city is very very warm which is which does not it does not look like it would be So that is, that is, that is what I said that you know I don't know whether it's it's it happens within you guys as well but it certainly happened with me Well uh being a young writer and your first book was a great success did you feel very stressful when you wrote your second book and even more stressful when you wrote your third book <laughs> <laughs> And how did you cope with your distress? Uh not really. See India India is a huge huge country. So even if your book is successful, it means that you would have sold 40,000 50,000 copies and there are about 50 more crore people that you can sell your book to. So there's absolutely no pressure. Uh so so uh, and initially I was not written in the media as well. So it really does not matter. You know, unless you you are you are a literary fiction writer and you your books get reviewed a lot that's when the pressure comes in since i was not from a literary background and i did not have peers who were in journalism or into writing i did not feel that pressure it seems that uh while planning your writing you start Uh, you start with character characterization and the message so what is the core value that you would like to convey to your readers in this book um uh, in general as a writer so here's a, it is assumed that you you start with some message that you would like to get across to your readers so what is the core value that you would like to convey so yeah uh you know i'm i'm pretty young so i get influenced by learned people very easily so every time i write a book i have something else in mind so uh while i was writing this book uh i was i was very disturbed by uh by the by the lack of interest that people have in reading so that was that was the core message that i wanted to start out with that you know you have to read that's why the main character belongs to a family of librarians and he's constantly around books and that is what makes him a better person so i wanted to bring that message out uh the second message w- out was obviously that there's there's a line in the book that says that eyes complicate things you know when when you when you stress too much on how the person looks and how the person acts in front of you you do not concentrate too much on how the person is in reality or how the person uh, is on the inside so this is the second message that i wanted to put across that is why i made the girl blind so that you know and and she and and the girl is very pretty but she has absolutely no concept of being of what prettiness is or so even if somebody tells her that you know you're beautiful the girl would say i do not know what what that means so these are the two messages i wanted to put across One last question. Yes. Hi Mr. Data, uh, nice meeting you. Uh, first of all, I suppose you will keep on writing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, um what makes you keep on writing and what are you chasing for except money, reputation or satisfaction? Okay. <laughs> That's pretty much it. <laughs> but yes but yes more books and uh, what what makes me keep writing is it's it's something it, it is it is such an integral part of my life now that i cannot uh, not write it makes me i mean we we all do something in our lives right so if you if you were to say uh, what you did in 
and you cannot think of what you did in 2003 it means that you wasted your life in 2003 so i do not want a year in my life that i said that that i can you know go in the future and say that okay i did not do anything at least i'll i'll now i'll i can say that i tried writing a book i tried writing a book which was about xyz concept so i can say that and this is what i want and what am i running for i don't know i mean it i have absolutely no idea okay thank you very much um thank joy and uh, we wish you uh, an enjoyable trip in hong kong thank you and found that your impressions about the real hong kong would confirm what you have been trying to portray in your latest book and we wish you every success uh, with your latest um, thank you uh, artwork right thank you and Which it's an honor and a privilege to be here thank you very much indeed thank you, thank you.